autumn morning. I hope that you were able to breathe deep in the crisp morning air and to take in the kaleidoscope of color. Would you join us in singing the time change song? Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a reminder we've been making this a tradition and I uh, believe we'll have the lyric up and and an audio file to sing this with, since we do not have live accompaniment today. We don't have that. Oh, okay, if we do not have the music part, I think we'll just recite it together. All righty. Join with me. God of every choir member, we need sleep to sing our best. Help each singer to remember, take that extra hour of rest. Change those clocks one backward hour. Don't arrive at church too soon, or the anthem by yourself you'll croon. And just a little reminder uh, to, to set your clocks, was it spring forward and fall back uh, for next weekend, and that will help. All right, would you join us in a responsive reading, reading on the screen? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise, praise the Lord, Lord as long as, as I live. live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no help. When, when their, their breath, breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is in the God of heaven, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, 
who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Bow with me in prayer. We give you thanks that great and small, rich and poor, young and old, we are all able to make a difference. Open our eyes and our hearts to the opportunities to serve you as we give and as we receive. Guide us in our worship, bless us in our ministry of music, and strengthen our ties even as circumstances keep many of us apart. We are your people. We dedicate this hour to you.
from the book of Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one, and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Good morning. Good to see you today. Uh, well, during our, our recent vacation, uh, we got up way too early one day to drive from our hotel in Newport Beach to a nearby peninsula uh, in order to go on a whale watching trip. Uh, the, the, the company that, that uh, offers these trips has a uh, you know, it, it's a little pricey, but the nice thing is if you don't see any whales, you can go back for seven bucks. Well, we were going back for seven bucks each to, and, and looking forward just, just to be on a boat and look out in the ocean. Uh, all of a sudden, though, as we were driving, Jenny got an alert on her phone. It looked like an amber alert, something, you know, we, we need to take care of right then. Was a child kidnapped? Was somebody in danger? No, not at all. It was a traffic warning, just letting us know that the next day, a dignitary was coming to that area, right where we were driving. And we were being warned that the streets would be closed, the traffic cordoned off at a specific time, those very roads we were driving along. Uh, uh, so without knowing it ahead of time, we'd made a great choice to go whale watching that morning instead of the next day, because otherwise we either wouldn't have made it to the dock or... Had we gone off on the ride, we wouldn't have been allowed off and able to go back to our hotel room to do nothing. Uh, so, and as it turned out, by the way, we saw, a lot, we saw lots of uh, uh, porpoises and sea lions and stuff, but we got another $7 uh, whale watching trip coming to us. <laughs> it's kind of like a racket when you think about it. Anyway, well, the next day we couldn't help but be a little curious, so we put on the 11 o'clock news to you know, just to see the footage about the, the visiting dignitary and all that, uh, all the streets cordoned off, and, and a motorcade going by, so there wasn't much to see. Uh, you know, the people were looking at the motorcade. They were holding up signs either in support of the dignitary or, or in protest against the dignitary. I, I guess that's a sign of our time. Uh, but this is California, which means also everybody on the street had their dog with them. And... Uh, uh, you know, they, uh, while everybody else was watching the security detail and everything, as I was watching the footage, the dogs weren't watching the dignitary. The dogs didn't care. The dogs were looking at other dogs. The dogs were looking at people that mattered, you know, people with food, people they cared about, the shoes of strangers which smelled like other dogs, you know. They had a totally different uh, way of, of giving the attention of their eyes to that scene. Not only that, the dogs, you know, dogs have a chronological sense of smell. You may not know that, but they not only can smell, but they can smell when th those smells were made or when you walked by or whatever. So, so there was a whole story being built up about what was going on that had nothing to do with the television coverage. Well... Dogs look at the world in a different way. They don't care about power or wealth. They look at relationships. They smell emotions. And they'll stick with a homeless guy as long as they're loved and in a relationship that matters to them. 
Matter of fact, that's one reason dogs are perfect for the homeless is because they're not worried about where, where the money is or where the wealth is. They just trust and, and figure, let's go on. Let's see what happens next. They hang together regardless of what goes on. It got me to thinking about how powerful our eyes are in terms of the attention we give. My phone tells me every week how much eye time I gave to my phone that week, whether it's up or down. That's always sobering. Oh, my goodness gracious, what have I done? And my phone knows what, where I am when I'm looking. I, I hadn't been in California more than a couple days when the ads that come with words with friends had nothing to do with Indiana anymore. They were all about the proposition measures that were on the California ballot. Commercials for those, which, of course, I'm not a Californian anymore, so didn't matter. I wasn't voting on those, so it was a waste of their time. Uh, but it's a reminder that advertisers watch every step and know what you're looking at. And so you have to remember, your eye time is valuable. It really matters, and you may not think of it that way. Uh, we know now a lot more about the physiology of, of your eyes. But uh, the ancients had a different perspective. And yet, even though they were wrong about physiologically what your eyes do, they were right about emotionally what your eyes do. They believed that you projected light from your eyes. The reason you saw things was the light from your eyes would hit the object. And therefore, you had a lot of power. In, in the Old Testament, uh, there's... there's uh, uh, you're probably familiar with the term evil eye. You know, we say if looks could kill. And even though we don't believe your eye is shooting out rays anymore, we know that some looks can kill. You know, you, you, you're around somebody, and, and they don't have to say a word. They are harming you with the way it lo you look. And uh, uh, in Proverbs, for instance, uh, there's a proverb that says, don't, don't eat the food of a stingy man. Because even though he says eat and drink, he is keeping an account of what you're doing. Well, the word in Hebrew isn't really stingy, man. It's don't eat the food of the person with the evil eye. Because that evil eye is trying to harm you. They may say, yeah, welcome, come eat and drink. But, but they're shooting darts at you the entire time while you eat. On the other hand, in exact opposition to the evil eye. They believed in the good eye. In Proverbs 22, 9, you know, uh, it says the person with the good eye is blessed because they share bread with the poor. Seeing the poor that are there, acknowledging them is a real blessing. Beyond the gift of food, when... Uh, with, with the Church of the Brethren in Everett, Pennsylvania, as you may have heard, uh, we would often go to Washington, D.C. to make food for, you know, uh, cook food for the food uh, pantry and serve people lunch. It was something we did on a monthly basis. And the important thing was not only to be charitable and to, we tried to cook as great a meal as we could uh, to show how important these people were, but we also sat down and ate with them and talked with them. We could see them. I was listening to a podcast yesterday, and one fellow was saying, you know, in so many stories I hear, we're very well practiced in not seeing the homeless. This person lives in a big city. But said, do you know how powerful it is? Even if, even if you're uncomfortable with giving them money, to say hi, because that person lives in your neighborhood and actually exists. To make eye contact is an extraordinary gift. Well, this particular passage talks about, you know, loving your neighbor as yourself. Not just loving God, but loving neighbor. And one of the things that Mark does then is tell you a story right afterwards to illustrate what it means to, to love your neighbor. And we see that this is by using your eyes. In, in uh, uh, you know, this person has come to learn about what is the greatest commandment, but it's not just theoretical. 
So right afterwards, you know, Jesus warns, beware of the scribes and the teachers because they, uh, um, you know, they look holy. They wear the nicest robes. They get the best seats. But they devour widows' houses. You know, they take advantage of the vulnerable in the society. They don't see them as fellow human beings, but they see them with their eyes, with their evil eye, as someone to be pillaged, as someone to steal from, as someone to find a way to put them into a situation where they have so much debt they lose their homes. Widows and orphans were the most vulnerable members of society in the ancient world uh, because women could not be employed uh, and, and if they did not, were not connected to a male, then they didn't have a source of income. If they had uh, no help from family, uh, they were nothing. And these people took advantage of them. And then Jesus uh, uh, tells a, uh, doesn't tell a story, but also illustrates it. He looks, you know, while, while, the, while the rich devour and conquer the poor, the marginalized, the suffering... Jesus turns the attention of his disciples away from the pageant that's going on in the temple. People are leaving large sums of money for the work of God in the temple. And in those days, of course, you didn't have direct deposit, nor could you write a check. You know, a check whispers when it drops into a collection plate. Money was metal, and the bigger and the heavier it was, the more valuable. So... Everybody knew the size of your offering because of the sound it made as you dropped it into these trumpet-shaped uh, uh, receptacles. It would, it would hit the side, and it would go around, and it would clunk at the bottom. And in the midst of seeing that, Jesus tells the disciples to watch and to look and to give their eye time to the widow who comes forward with two coins that are so thin that they will make no sound. They will whisper. You know, the, the, the rich and powerful have made a pageant out of their giving. As uh, Bob Dylan once said, money doesn't talk, it swears. And there in the temple itself, the house of God, their offerings meant for uh, ostensibly the work of God has been swearing because these are the ones who are devouring widows' houses. But now we see one of these widows. We see an actual human being. Instead of listening about the statistic about poverty, we see poverty. Not only that, we see somebody who looks beyond the letter of the law because temple law required that every man give a certain amount of money every year. And I use the term man deliberately because women were exempt. It was the man who was supposed to give the money. So this widow does not have to contribute to the work of God. But she chooses to in her poverty. And that's what Jesus wants us to see. Not to look at those who are making a great show of what they're doing, but to use the good eye to see what is most important. Because we have that opportunity all the time. We know the evil eye is very active in our world right now because it seems like that's where our attention is drawn again and again to what is worst in humanity, to what we're supposed to fear, and yet, with our good eye, we can see how people care enough about others to change their life, to wear masks, to be careful, to wash their hands, to sacrificially put somebody else first, even though it's awfully inconvenient. We see the world in a different light. We're like the dogs, maybe with the eyes of faith, we see relationships, and we see what matters instead of, what, instead of the powerful. You know, I've uh, taken a couple of workshops on Zoom uh, offered by my friends uh, uh, Bob Neff and Chris Booker, and uh, one of the things that they've demonstrated in these Zoom uh, 
conferences is the power of art. How art can help us see with the good eye what is going on in Scripture. Um, One of the things we did not do on this California trip, because so many things were closed because of the pandemic, was go to the Getty Museums, which I really enjoy. I enjoy the art. I enjoy... So uh, It's like going to church. There are so many biblical subjects, so many human subjects on display that, that walking around the various rooms is like being in church. So I didn't get to look at one of my favorite paintings. It's only 10 and a half by 12 and a half inches. Um, it was painted in 1598 by Jan Bruegel the Elder, but don't remember that. Go to your computer when you get home and just write Sermon on the Mount, Getty Museum. And you'll get that picture. It's a fantastic little painting in which it looks to me like there's over 200 people surrounding Jesus. And each one has a real face. Each one is either paying attention to the Lord of life who has something to say. We see Jesus there. Or they might have something more important. They're talking to friends. They're gossiping. One person is selling pretzels, just like it was a ball game. There's a fortune teller on the margin who's reading people's palms. There's all kinds of things going on, people trying to look good, the guys for the girls and the girls for the guys. But it's a reminder that wherever we are, something important is going on. The gospel may be spoken about, taught, or it may be lived around us. The words of Jesus coming to life. And if you don't pay attention, if you don't look with the good eye, you may miss it. There's, there's, in the midst of all of this confusion, there are people who are looking on the Lord of life, and they can't take their eyes off him. Let me just say that your eyes have power. There's a parade going by, Well, Jesus speaks the words of life. Jesus is directing your attention to the widows, to the orphans, to the real law, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So think like your dog. Not sure this works for cat people, but... (laughs) But think like your dog. (laughs) And, And ask, where is the love? Where is the relationship? Where is God? Look to Jesus because, folks, Jesus is looking at you. Amen.
Robinson, who was born in 1943, is a retired college professor and an author whose novels and nonfiction has won her a Pulitzer Prize, a National Award for the Humanities, and the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction. She's active in her Congregationalist Church in Iowa and even preaches on occasion. In a recent sermon, she said, and, and for much of this paragraph, I'm quoting from an article about her published earlier in September. Um, I have never been much good at the things most people do, and proceeded to describe the single day she spent as a waitress, a spectacular failure in which she spilled soup on a customer and was banished to the kitchen where an older waitress, taking pity on her, tried to give her the day's tips. Robinson likens the waitress's offer to the widow's might a gift made freely in contempt of circumstances, as she put it. Yet she felt she could not accept it and struggles still with the question of whether she should have done so. She credits the waitress with teaching her that generosity is a casting off of the constraints of prudence and self-interest. When people try to give to us, even when they can't afford it, we're granting them the gift of generosity. We have to let go of some of our pride, and it helps when we realize God can do all things quite well without us, yet somehow, mysteriously, applauds that widow for the tiniest gift possible. At this time when we joyfully give, let us pray for the grace to receive just as joyfully, since both giving and receiving are blessings. I'm going to pray now. Dwell in our hearts, God who gives generously, that we might receive with the same grace that we give. You have set us the example, receiving our prayers in which we give you advice on how to run the world, when this is your world, and you are mindful of much more than we can imagine. Bless us in this great work that we share, not only with you, but with each other. We thank you for the opportunity to receive as well as to give. This we pray in your name. Amen.
in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The nameless widow gave her might, but rest assured, Jesus knew her name. Jesus knows your name. Jesus knows our names. As we are known, as God delights in us, let us act prayerfully, peacefully, joyfully. Amen. You're calling, you're calling us to the cross.